What do you do when the monster is not under the bed? They're in the classroom. Erica Sanzi is going to talk to us about that in her latest piece, The Monster Is in the Classroom. It's not coming. It's there. So if you were thinking, I've got time, or this isn't going to come to my neighborhood, or this won't be in my school because we're conservative, or there's this or that or the other reason why it's not going to happen to you, I think you really need to listen. You need to read this article for yourself, but I'm going to go through it with my usual commentary along the way, and I hope that adds value. I hope you will find value in this channel in general and consider subscribing, liking, sharing the videos, commenting. That helps too. But um, you need to start thinking of this as being there because it was coming a decade ago. Now, now it's there. And you may just not recognize it yet because the words that are used perhaps in your school district sound nice enough. And we'll talk about that. But in practice, they're not nice. In practice, there's really no nice way to do what they're doing. And furthermore, it's questionable, questionable as to whether they should be doing anything at all, as to whether the underlying justification for doing any of this diversity, equity, and inclusion training in schools is even appropriate, okay? So even if we did it the right way, do we really need to be doing it when, for example, we have such a high percentage of kids who can't read and can't do math? We, we aren't doing that well. Are we in a position to ask our teachers and our schools and these already stretched budgets, or so we're told, um, to cover something that typically is pretty expensive and takes up a fair amount of time and requires the students to leverage a fair amount of attention and emotional energy, even when done correctly. So I want you to think about that as we read how they do it incorrectly, right? Should they even be doing it at all? So schools indoctrinate children as young as eight. Eight. In race and gender essentialism. Essentialism. Essentially, that's one of the most important things about you. Your identity is wrapped up in something you can't change. It will never change. You cannot grow and develop, as my friend Ada said today on our live stream, around that because it's not going to change. And it might give you some hint as to why people are thinking they want to change their gender because they're desperate to make a change away from something they've been told makes them an oppressor or makes them a victim, either of which could motivate someone to want to change, right? Something that was heretofore immutable, or so they thought. Anyway, let's continue. Many American parents may assume that culture war battles over critical race theory and wokeness are fought on legitimate terrain involving such matters as how high school students can best grapple with our nation's complex past. Perhaps they think that the sudden, suddenly ubiquitous topics of gender identity and preferred pronouns rankle only those parents who are old-fashioned in their thinking, if only. America's youngest students are being bombarded with classroom activism and indoctrination that is inappropriate, not only developmentally, but for public school systems in general. The contemporary obsession with identity has made its way into elementary school policy, curricula, and standards approved by state boards. While we continue to see poor reading and math scores, schools spend money and time confusing and shaming other people's children. Yours. Many educators and elected leaders have good intentions. They believe deeply that they are part of a necessary and long overdue movement to teach racial literacy, social justice, equity, and anti-racism. But as virtuous as these terms may sound on their face, they mean something else in far too many classrooms. American schools are teaching young children race essentialism, reducing them to identity groups, putting them in boxes labeled oppressor and oppressed, and often inflicting emotional and psychological harm. Now, I want to back up to this a bit. Remember I said it's a good idea to ask, is this even necessary? And some of you might be saying, well, of course it's necessary. We need to fight racism and we need to make sure we have social justice and equity and all of these things. Well, first of all, I think we need to come to an agreement as a country, certainly with regard to public spaces like public schools where we spend public 
you know, taxpayer dollars. I'm not going to call it public funds. It's our money. And we need to come to an agreement on what those terms mean. I don't think academics should tell us what they mean. I think we should be part of that conversation. It shouldn't be handed down to us because otherwise, especially when it's government doing the spending and the teaching and everything else, when they define the words, historically icky things happen. So we need to be on board and bought in to what terms like social justice and equity and anti-racism mean. It shouldn't be Ibram X. Kendi just declaring what it means because then what could happen is they could come along and redefine it on the fly if need be, if it's not achieving their desired ends. It should be our our desired ends. And when you're talking about in a school, even more so, we should have a say in what the definition of those terms is. That's first. And then decide, based on those definitions, do we think that school is the appropriate place to address these things? So for example, if we're talking social justice, should your eight-year-old child be involved in trying to achieve social justice? How is your child a conduit for this goal? Should they be? Why should they be? Someone needs to justify why your child should be used as part of that, that movement, okay? And finally, what if, just spitballing here, what if making sure every child can read and write and do math and be a, a, a personally responsible, fully functioning individual adult upon graduation from high school, whether they go to college or not, if they are law abiding, if they are um, respectful, polite, capable of earning a living at something, have a skill, have an interest, are mentally healthy, reasonably, okay, well adjusted, have some idea of how to form friendships and sustain them, okay? Explain to me how a population of people like I just described, where the majority are like that, irrespective of race, irrespective of their socioeconomic level, because school is supposed to be an equalizer, correct? We were sold on public school way back in the way back on this idea that, you know, that's what it is, even though behind closed doors, that wasn't necessarily what they meant for it to be. Nevertheless, over the years, and certainly since the civil rights movement, that's what we were told. That's That was the promise of desegregation. It was going to be the great equalizer, these schools. So if the schools were doing their job of educating, as I just described it, irrespective of talk about race at all, explain to me how people who are critical thinking, rational, well-read, uh, numerate, personally responsible, polite individuals, how is that society going to perpetuate evils like racism? How does that occur? Where does that occur? Because if all of these people are coming out of these schools and going out into the world to make their mark on the world and work at jobs, work with other people, have children, get married, etc., how's it going to last? Why? We're accepting on like at face value that we need to be doing this, but we're just doing it wrong. And I want to go back a step farther and go, should we even be doing this at all? If we did, if the schools did their job and it turned out educated, critical thinkers, racism would be a thing of the distant past or it would exist in the individual minds of some very troubled people and isolated parts of our society where they were in hiding because it would be so shunned in public life. It just wouldn't be something that would happen. If you saw it, you'd be like, Ugh, you know, it'd be weird. Okay. But we're not doing that. We're in fact doing the opposite of that. We're spending an inordinate amount of time trying to teach people of what to think about things, about race. And we're ignoring the reading and we're ignoring the math. I mean, we really are. We're taking a lot of time, instructional time, emotional time, physical time away from the core skills. And in pursuit of something called equity, we're, we're going to not look at grades. We're, you know, let's not do the standardized tests. Let's say, you know, let's not. Do, how are we going to know how we're even doing? How are we going to hold these schools accountable? How are we going to see the achievement gap? If we're just so busy focusing on all this, we start doing away with standards and claiming it's part of the same social justice fight. Is school now... The vehicle for social justice in America, is that the purpose of education? Make them say it. 
make them say that your child's purpose in being compelled to go to school by the government is to be an activist for progressive change. Make them say it. Ask the question, why? Why are you using school at all to do this? Don't accept that it's a legitimate function of school. Question that. If this sounds extreme, that's because it is. I agree. It is not happening everywhere, but it is happening enough to have juiced a multi-billion dollar nationwide industry. Sometimes the source is a rogue teacher whom the principal and superintendent admit they are trying to rein in. But increasingly, it is simply public officials implementing approved policies. I'm going to stop here. Public officials implementing approved policies. Very often what you will find is people will look at what did they do in the next district? What did they do? You know, what does the board say we should do? What did... what was the contractor they used over? You're like, who do you, yeah, okay, let's use that too. There's not a lot of thought that goes into choosing these things because, again, there's nobody really holding them accountable for the individual choice. So it can be even used as evidence that, well, they used it in this district and, you know, they liked it. So we're going to use it too. Or we heard good things. So it's the one we know, or it's the one they're using statewide. You need to get in there and before they go paying for a program with your tax dollars, by the way, that is going to abuse your children and indoctrinate them, you should demand to know how they chose this particular program. So we've got, why are we doing this in school at all? Why are we doing this in school? In other words, this version of equity, this definition of racism, this definition of inclusion and all this stuff. And then, okay, you've already decided the, the definitions of the words. You've, 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 you're already 50 steps ahead of where I think you ought to be. But why this one? Defend this program. It's not choosing Microsoft or Apple, okay? It, it's, it, these are ideas that are shaping the minds of young children, They used to say when I worked in technical consulting, oh, nobody ever got fired for buying Microsoft. (laughs) And that would be the explanation as to why people consistently just chose Microsoft all the time. Or they chose Microsoft software for word processing or whatever. Nobody ever got fired for it. Well, that's what you have in public schools. Nobody's getting fired for choosing something behind which there's no evidence, when they're supposed to be, by the way. Many places, I think it might be nationwide, that's against the law. But nobody's getting fired for it. These things are not being evaluated. They're not even doing a good job of evaluating reading curricula. They're just now figuring out 25 years after adopting it that, you know, maybe whole word's not a really good idea. People are increasingly illiterate. We've known the reading science for a very long time, and yet it just will, they bought it, and they bought it, and they're using it, and they're using it. So take a cue from that. The way they've chosen the curriculum to teach your kid reading and math was somebody told somebody in authority told me it was good or I was told to buy it or I was told to use it or the president, the Department of Education, Common Core, this, that, you know. Individuals who have the authority to make these choices are not being held accountable for the choices. That's on you, parents. That's on you. No one else is going to do it. So this multi-billion dollar nationwide industry has sprung up and they know how to sell their product that they're they're in it to sell their product people who are going to teach your kids that capitalism is the worst thing ever and they should strive for socialist utopia are making bank teaching that and they know exactly how to market it they know exactly how to package it they know exactly what emotional buttons to push and they know exactly how to use references from other districts. Well, they bought it and they liked it. We were in there and it was very happy and very successful and everything was wonderful. So it's incumbent upon you to say, that's not good enough. I don't care who else used it. I don't care. I mean, if you went to your doctor, if you went to your psychologist specifically and said, I need help for this problem I'm having, would you say, well, my other patients have loved this particular thing that I've done and they really like it and it worked for them. Or would you say, I I want you to relate to me. I want you to tell me why it should work for me. You need to approach this the same way. Why is it going to work for this school, this population of children, in this time, in this place, right now, 
you shouldn't care what happened even in the school district down the street in the same state. You need to be that granular with demanding they explain to you why they chose a particular program. And have they seen the lesson plans? And if you're already down the path road now, they've, you know, th- it's already in there and you're looking at the lesson plans, hold their feet to the fire. Go and say, explain. Explain how this is good for my child. Explain. They won't be able to. I'll just tell you right now. You know. Spoiler alert. Consider Bellevue, Washington, home to Cherry Crest Elementary School. The school website indicates that students will have explicit conversations about race, equity, and access and will identify culture and begin to recognize and identify white culture through storytelling, sharing, and conversation. The school promises to hold monthly assemblies that focus on culture, identity, and race and has created a group called SOAR, Students Organized Against Racism. For fourth and fifth graders, these children who range from ages nine to 11 are tasked with implementing learning and strat implementation of school-wide learning and strategies for being anti-racist. Left unclear is whether these students have been made aware that modern anti-racism requires discrimination on the basis of race. More importantly, left unclear is whether these elementary school students, we're talking seven six or seven to 10 or 11 should be tasked with implementing learning of anything unrelated to their own learning of reading and math and maybe science, a little history. Okay. Well, what? They're elementary school students. They range in age from nine to 11. Okay. And here, whether modern anti-racism requires discrimination on the basis of race, how about whether Children of this age should be involved in doing anything to do with anti-racism. And let's take a look at these. We'll have explicit conversations. Oh, I need an example of that, please. About race. What is race? Can the school please define for me what race is? I'm dying to hear this one. Equity. Again, that would be helpful. Define equity, please. And access. Access to what? And why are the 9 to 11-year-olds responsible for any of this? Why are they having explicit conversations about this stuff? None of this is their responsibility. It's not. It's the adult's responsibility to make sure that children have access, that there is, you know, equity or equal access or whatever. It's the adult's responsibility to make sure that the children treat each other respectfully by setting some basic boundaries and ground rules, not by drilling into the individual kid's head, you know, what to feel or what to think about what they feel and all of that. That is just not their responsibility. Or take Lexington, Massachusetts, where October 2019, fourth graders were taught to articulate what gender identity is and why it's important to use non-binary language in describing people we don't know yet. Why is it? Why is it important to use non-binary language in describing people we don't know yet? If we don't know them, why are we talking about them? Why are we talking about people we don't know when they're behind our backs? And if we make a mistake when it comes to what gender somebody is, why not teach humility and forgiveness and understanding and those kinds of things in young children instead of pretending there's a problem that is so widespread that there are so many people they're going to encounter that are non-binary so it's such a huge population that they need to alter the way they speak. Why are we burdening them with this extra little bit of anxiety about people they don't know and probably haven't even met? Why don't we just instead teach them to be nice people and when you meet someone and you're not really sure, you know, just be nice to them, ask them their name, ask them who they are, what they like to do. Does it matter? Does it matter? And And here's another tip for you. Kids will work it out. They'll work it out, especially kids this young. They goof up and they're like, you know, hey, you know, you want to come play play baseball with me and other friends, whatever. And I mean, if the kid's like, I'm a girl, they'll say, first of all, that's a gerrindender stereotype anyway. What kind of mistake is the child going to make? I mean, I'm trying to come up with one and all I'm coming up with is gender stereotypes. What kind of mistake are they going to make where they accidentally accidentally say she? So the other kid says, actually, I'm... a boy. Oh, okay. Sorry. What's going to happen next? What is the kid going to go? Oh, that's weird. I thought you were a girl. I mean, now you have a conversation about politeness. Now you have a conversation about that's not very polite. Just say, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. You can deal with that on a case by case basis. 
You do, the school, you don't set people up with all these anxieties about now I don't even want to talk to anybody. And if I can't tell what gender you are immediately, I'm going to walk away and cross the playground and I'm not even going to speak to you. Now the poor kid has no friends. Kids are going to work it out. So, according to photos shared on Twitter by the district's director of equity and student support, students learned about gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation in elementary school. And sex assigned at birth. Now we're questioning what mom and dad have told us since we were born. Mm, no, not sex assigned at birth. That is your biological sex. So now we're anti-science also in the school. What, what are we setting our kids up for? So first, we're teaching them that a lie is true because race is a lie. Only some people believe it. But we're going to teach everyone it's true that it's true because some people believe it. And now, again, the same thing. This is not science. This is not reality. It's not sex assigned at birth. It is your biological sex. So the schools are now lying to our children and pitting them against us because the kid might come home and say, you told me I was a girl. What if I'm not? By examining sticky notes on a gender snow person who was drawn a magic marker in a large sheet of paper. The students were also taught that their pronouns had been assigned at birth. Yeah. No to all of this. Just no. No. Teaching kids to be polite, good little humans is all you need to do. Teach them to read, teach them to write, teach them math. This is just so inappropriate, up, down, every which direction. No. Just no. There are grooming behaviors that are going on in these questions. There, are, This it just ought to be illegal straight up. You parents need to put your foot down. This is so confusing to young children. Just no. In Oregon, teachers can now use state standards in ethnic studies starting in September 2021. The standards will become a mandatory part of the curriculum in 2025. The Oregon Department of Education released an update on the standards last year. While most Americans may not consider gender an essential component of ethnic studies, I sure don't, the Oregon Department of Education does. The revised recommendations for the standards require kindergartners to understand their own identity groups, including but not limited to race, gender, family, ethnicity, culture, religion, and ability. First graders will be able to describe how individual and group characteristics are used to divide, unite, and categorize racial, ethnic, and social groups. This is outrageous. This is child abuse. Telling a child is not begun to investigate their own personal identity separate and apart from their family, which is, by the way, developmentally appropriate for them to identify as, you know, their name possibly their gender that their parents have told them they are. And unless they've had a conversation privately about something different, that's what they know they are. None of your damn business to insert yourself into that. And then as a member of that family or a member of whatever their little culture is at home, it is not the school's business to start asking them to declare any of that, to investigate any of that, to, you know, construct it, deconstruct it, discuss it publicly. No, no. Teach them the basic skills and teach them to be nice, good little humans, and you won't need to be teaching this. But of course, that's not the point, is it? They're teaching these things for the purpose of dividing and inserting political ideology into the classroom, which is much easier to do when people see themselves as parts of groups, because now we can divide and assign grievances to people, which makes it a lot easier to politicize everything else, but I digress. In Rockwood, Missouri, a fifth grade teacher recently gave students a handout with a written excerpt by Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. The writings included the claim that Michael Brown was murdered, just stepped from his mother's home in Ferguson, Missouri. That's an outright lie. They did not mention Attorney General Eric Holder's conclusion that the facts did not support the filing of criminal charges against Officer Darren Wilson. Not even close. The handout goes on. Disruption is the new world order. It's the way in which those denied power assert power. And in the context of a larger strategy for how to contend with power, disruption is an important way to surface new possibilities. What they're basically saying is it's perfectly okay to go out and just destroy things. When I asked the school principal about the assignment, he said this was used by a teacher and is not a Rockwood approved resource. I am working with the teacher to ensure that only Rockwood curricular resources are used when teaching lessons. Teachers should be fired. This is what I'm saying to you, parents. I'm working with a teacher. I'm CYA, 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 CYA. Teacher's still there. What does working with mean? And why is the teacher still employed here? There are good teachers being blacklisted. They can't even get jobs. They're not getting permanent contracts because they ask questions about this curriculum. There are people of fear of losing their jobs for simply asking questions about this curriculum. 
And yet we're not hearing that this teacher was fired. And they probably aren't going to be. And you parents need to raise holy hell when this happens. You need to demand the termination of people who go rogue like this. It's that, well, we're working with them. If you did this at your job, if you went off script this much with your clients or whatever, and your boss had to come in and be like, yeah, well, that I did, you'd be fired, gone. Somebody who had the care of children in their job description did this. They should not have a job and they should never again have a job with teaching children. I will stay. I will die on that hill. This past February, students in Evanston, Illinois, listened to the book, Not My Idea, a book about whiteness. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to cover that book on this channel because it is insane. Parents were asked to discuss the book with their children at home. The book says that whiteness is a bad deal. It is a bad deal because it doesn't exist. Whiteness isn't a thing. It's a construct. You're now asking elementary school children to understand a construct that you made up for which there's no basis in evidence. You literally made it up. You made it up. You might as well go in and teach them about the spaghetti monster. And that you can be white without signing on to whiteness. Apparently you can't. I mean, I've had conversations with people who say that actually that's not possible. That no matter what I do, no matter which way I go, I'm going to, you know, I can't, I can't get away from it. And talk to Robin D'Angelo, she'll tell you that. As Connor Friedersdorf reports in The Atlantic, Evanston schools asked kindergarten parents to quiz their five and six-year-olds on whiteness and to give them examples of how whiteness shows up in school or in the community. No, no. And the Evanston parents probably went along with it. I don't care if you're the only parent in the district or you believe that you're the only parent in the district that has a problem with this. You need to open your mouth and you need to fight back. This is not appropriate. Go do your own homework if you don't believe me. This is not okay. This is not age appropriate. This is not psychologically appropriate for these children. And I don't care that you're the only one. I don't care that you're scared. I don't care that you're afraid you're going to lose your friends or you're going to get in trouble or you might lose your job or your kid's going to get backlash, whatever. This is your child being abused. There's no excuse. There's no excuse. I'm sorry to be so harsh, but you know, that the parents so actually they were told the to quiz that it should have been the we should have heard on the nightly news that the parents of Evanston, Illinois were, you know, protesting at the school building, demanding that the people who assigned this this book get fired. When I show you this book, and I will I promise I will make a video, you will your jaw will drop with this book. In Cupertino, California, third graders at R.I. Meyerholtz Elementary School, I have covered this on this channel, were required to deconstruct their racial identities and then rank themselves according to their power and privilege. Third grade, they're eight, maybe nine. The teacher asked all students to create an identity map, which required them to list their race, class, gender, religion, family structure, and other characteristics. Many of these children, by the way, are Asian. And this was done in what was supposed to be a math enrichment class. The teacher explained to students that they live in a dominant culture of white, middle-class, cisgender, educated, able-bodied Christian English speakers who, according to the lesson, created and maintained this culture in order to hold power and stay in power. Students were then asked to deconstruct these intersectional identities and circle these the identities that hold power and privilege on their identity maps, ranking their traits based on the hierarchy the teacher had just explained to them. The teacher's like, I'm giving you this and I'm telling you to do this thing and now you're going to do it and there's no questioning. There's, a, there's a eight or nine-year-olds. Oh. Oh, it's okay, you know. No ability at all to question whether any of this is even real. Whether they could tell them that you live in a society of you know unicorns and rainbows and this is and that's and and put you and here's the matrix of where you fall in all of that and they had no capacity to question it. And by the way, some of the parents, Chinese American parents who'd escaped from Mao's China, were pretty upset about this because it was really familiar. Some parents may agree with such content. I really don't care. <laughs> but public institutions funded with public dollars do not exist to groom activists for particular causes, shame children for their immutable traits, or deny them agency or their childhood. Or groom them for sexual exploitation, by the way. We are talking about eight and nine-year-old kids who believe in Santa Claus, hide their lost teeth under their pillow for the tooth fairy, and curl up in their parents' laps for comfort and love. It is immoral, at least, to reduce them to confected racial and gender categories and to teach them to do the same to others. Parents around the country need to understand what is happening in growing number of elementary school or elementary classrooms. You need to not just understand it, guys. 
what you actually did, you can't understand it. It's not comprehensible. You need to only know that it's happening and then get ready to fight back. Okay, how are you going to do that? Well, first of all, Erica is the director of outreach of Parents Defending Education. So you need to join this organization. You need to get involved in your local chapter. If you don't have one, start one. You need to know the law. You need to have it memorized. You need to print out copies of it, carry it around with you. you. You can go into the school and demand that people be held accountable when they violate the law. Your child has rights. You have rights. You need to learn what they are. They are violating several of them, by the way, in many of the, in these trainings. Um, I'll have to do a separate video on that, but this is unconscionable. So as I said, you got to go really all the way back to like, should we even be doing this at all? Is this the proper role of government, period? Is this the proper role of government school? And then get down from there. But if it's already in your school, it's too late. They already decided. They already decided. So put together your principled arguments about why you think it's not, demand accountability, Hold people accountable and don't stop until you get it. Don't stop. It's time to get brave for your kids because this will mess them up for a long, long time, possibly for life. All right. So again, thank you for watching. If you find this content helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. That's the video.